So last year I bought the Fujifilm X-H2 and the Fujifilm X-H2S, but this year I only have one of them. What's up y'all? My name's Chris Tejas. I'm a photographer and videographer based in Ontario, Canada, and I shoot primarily with Fujifilm. And I have pretty much since I started. Uh, you know, last year I bought the Fujifilm X-H2 and the Fujifilm X-H2S, and I bought them for different reasons, but I had a really good deal and I figured I would get them both so I could have an A cam and a B cam, so I could have two bodies if I was gonna shoot weddings, so I could have a high megapixel body and a lower megapixel body. I could have like a video centric camera and then a still centric camera. But eventually I decided I was gonna pare down my gear and just, just go with one body for everything and use that as a hybrid body and save myself some money and invest that money in other ways. So if you've seen any of my content so far, and if you looked at the thumbnail, you'll know that I kept the Fujifilm X-H2S. Why did I do that? Well, there were five main reasons why I chose to keep the Fujifilm X-H2S and to give up the Fujifilm X-H2. So the first one is the buffer. Now, both these cameras have great buffers. It's not like I was out shooting the X-H2 on a regular basis, but as I started to develop what I was doing and I started to realize that I was doing a lot of sports, I had this really frustrating experience where I would take a whole bunch of photos really quickly. I would set it to 20, 30 frames per second and snap a whole bunch of photos. And then I would wanna really quickly take a short video clip. You know, I would set up my record button to film at 60 frames per second and I could just capture quick clips that I could then slow down and use for Instagram reels or for any kind of video project I was working on to complement the photos. Now, the problem was with the X-H2, oftentimes I would kind of fill up that buffer a bit too close. And then when I go to record a video, I would notice either it just wouldn't start right away or it would lag or there, there would just be issues. It didn't happen all the time, but it happened often enough that sometimes I was missing key things I really wanted to capture on video, or I would have to decide, is this a photo or a video moment? And what I've noticed is with the X-H2S, that just doesn't really happen. I can, you know, smash through a whole bunch of photos and then really quickly just hit that record button and it'll just start right away. Now, this isn't something that's gonna affect everybody, but for me, knowing that I really just wanted to go down to one camera where I could just use it for everything, this was something I had to consider. So yes, the buffer was important, but for most people, the buffer on the X-H2 is gonna be fine. It's really just in those very specific scenarios where you wanna switch back and forth from doing a lot of photos quickly to a kind of higher frame rate video that you're gonna notice issues. I could foresee going into the wedding season this year that that will happen actually quite a bit if I wanna capture a whole bunch of burst photos of first kiss and then quickly just hit that button and, and maybe get the last couple seconds as a video or what have you, whatever, whatever moment I wanna capture, I think this camera will be better suited to that. The other thing about the buffer is that knowing that I was going down to one camera, yes, I had some concerns about like, is this gonna be enough megapixel for me? I don't do a lot of cropping, so I wasn't super, super concerned about that, but I do some food and commercial work sometimes and it's nice to have that extra resolution. But just knowing that most of the time I didn't need that extra resolution, it was important to me to consider all the other things I had to pay for, like storage and uh, on the cloud storage, physically the amount of capacity I can get per memory card. And knowing that I just really wasn't going to need all that extra resolution was a pretty simple answer for me to just shift towards the 26 megapixels, which is still plenty. Anything I'm gonna to deliver to a client is gonna be more than enough, unless I have to do some serious cropping, in which case, uh-oh, I don't know, uh, it's not ideal, but just throw in a black and white, no one will notice the noise anyways, I guess. Reason number two that I kept the X-H2S is the open gate recording. It's a reality that clients want vertical video, and I'm not one of those people who's like dead against vertical video. I don't really care. Like, I don't, I don't love it. It's not my favorite way to watch something, but at the same time, it is how I end up consuming a lot of content because I think a lot of people like to act like they hate vertical video, but then they're spending all day on Instagram, so they're seeing lots of it. So I don't know, get over yourself. But what I really like about the open gate option is the fact that I don't have to think about framing quite as much. I know that if I am generally following the rule of thirds or I'm keeping my subject more or less in the center, it's gonna be very easy for me to cut that into something vertical later on if I need to. Um, that is a huge help with the workflow. It makes things faster. It just, it, it allows more breathing room when you're creating vertical video. And I think a lot of times, vertical video looks very claustrophobic. Like right now I'm I'm recording in 4K instead of the open gate. And if I were to cut this into vertical, all of a sudden we're losing a lot of context and everything just feels kind of claustrophobic. 
and I didn't want that for all of my videos. So I thought that that would be a really helpful thing to have, and, and, and it is. The other kind of cool thing is that it also matches the aspect ratio of photos, right? So if I'm taking a bunch of photos and then I want to take some video, it's all gonna be the same thing so I can crop it the same way and I don't have to worry about what that's gonna look like in post. The major downside being that shooting in 6K does chew up a lot of memory. And to be honest, I edit everything on my iPad. I don't have a computer. And so whether I'm using DaVinci or LumaFusion or one of those apps, I find that it struggles with the 6K footage from this camera. I've got a pretty good iPad and it can, it can burn through 4K footage pretty easily. And I don't really struggle with it too much. But if I have a 6K footage going into my timeline, and especially if I stack that, like if I have more than one thing going where I'm cutting between clips and I'm trying to do J cuts and all that stuff, uh, it crashes constantly and, and that's a huge pain in the ass. And it's a nightmare actually, <laughs> so much so that I, I'm not really recording in 6K as much as I'd like to. Uh, but that's not a problem with the camera, that's a problem with me not having the funds to allocate towards the right kind of computer to work with that footage. I will say though, I think sometimes Fuji footage can be tough on computers and I don't know enough about the technical reasons why, but that's just a different kind of thing. Anyways, the point is, if you are looking to record open gate, you can't do that with the X-H2, but you can with the X-H2S. I think that's awesome. Uh, you can also do it with the X-S20, which is pretty cool. So that's another reason you could go to a camera like that. But I just wanted all the other little things that the X-H2S has over the X-S20, for example. Okay, so the third one, it kind of relates to the first one, actually, the buffer, uh, which is rolling shutter. Um, people talk a lot about rolling shutter and people are on various sides of it. Some people are like, get over yourself. Some people are like, it's the worst thing in the world. I fall more into the camp of it's the worst thing in the world. I hate it. It really annoys me. Um, I shoot a lot of fast moving stuff when I'm shooting like sports videos or documentary style stuff. And every time I see that like motion, you know, that weird, those weird lines you get that look like you were like doing this, it, it's, it's annoying and it bothers me. And I know that clients don't see it, but it bothers me. And to be honest, I look at my footage more than my clients do. And so given the option, I wanted to deal with that. The X-H2S has great rolling shutter performance. And yes, that's not the be all end all. That's, that's not gonna change the narrative of something that you're making, but it will make you feel better. And sometimes you just gotta do what's better for you. One thing about rolling shutter that I actually think is important to, to remember too, is that when you're cutting down to a vertical aspect ratio, I find that rolling shutter becomes more noticeable because it's just, you're, you have less real estate to work with. So you're not seeing as wide of an image. So when you move things, it just becomes more noticeable when those straight lines kind of go back and forth like that. And um, it's annoying as hell. If, if you don't think it's annoying, fine. But that's a good enough reason for me when I was looking at these two cameras to decide I wanted to go with this over that. Fourth reason why I went with the X-H2S over the X-H2 is because I was looking for a hybrid camera. I was looking for a camera that could kind of do everything. And I wanted to make sure that not only my camera could do everything I needed it to, but that I was utilizing all the things that the camera could offer. So for example, like the pixel shift mode in the X-H2 where you can get those monsters like 160 megapixel files, I was never using those. 8K footage, super cool. I was never using, my iPad couldn't handle it as I told you. So there's no point for me to be using that. So I just found that like, if I'm gonna have one camera, I want it to do everything I need and I want to need everything it can do. Does that make sense? And when I was looking at all these little things, I really had to think to myself, what is my workflow gonna be? You know, when using the camera itself, there are little things like the X-H2S has better autofocus performance, for sure. It's not night and day different, but it's a little bit better. And Fujifilm is still a little bit behind on their autofocus compared to Sony and Canon. And so it made sense to go with the one that would have better autofocus performance. If I was just shooting portraits all the time, or I was just shooting commercial work where it was like food or something like that, I wouldn't care about that even a little bit. But the fact that I'm shooting events, I'm shooting things that can't happen twice, like races or like weddings or stuff like that. It's really important that the autofocus lives up to where I need it to. And to be honest, if I was just using the X-H2, it would be enough, but having something a little better is nice. Like right now I'm using the autofocus and I don't know, hopefully it hasn't hunted a whole bunch, but I'm feeling pretty confident with it. I'm, I'm not checking on it constantly like I used to with some of the older Fuji cameras and 
Uh, I'm just, I, 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 it's a sigh of relief, I guess. The last reason why I decided to keep the XH2S was because of resale value. I think we're in a bit of a weird time right now when it comes to Fujifilm, and I've got quite a few videos coming out of trying to describe this weirdness that we're in and the future of Fujifilm from, from my perspective at least. But I think the X-H2 is not that enticing of a camera for a lot of people. Everybody is excited about the idea of what's coming next, be it the X100R or the X-Pro4 or what have you. And we have things like the X-T5 and we have all these high resolution cameras coming out. And yes, the X-H2 outperforms the X-T5 we don't know what it's going to do compared to the X-Pro4 yet at the time of recording. We don't know what the X100R is necessarily going to be, if that's even the name of it. And so I think the Fujifilm X-H2 is just kind of in this weird space where there's other cameras that do what it does. You know, the closest thing to what the X-H2S does is like the GFX system or maybe the X-S20, but the X-S20 is more consumer. Uh, it doesn't have a dual memory card. It's not as robust. Um, the build quality isn't quite the same and the gfx is just like way too expensive and then you also have all these problems where like the rolling shutter on it comparatively is like just terrible and and, and it's just not really the same thing the xh2s is its own entity whereas the xh2 most of what it can do is basically being accomplished in like the xt5 or what have you and i think that hits at a fundamental issue which is that the xh2 and the xh2s were such a divergence from what people loved about Fujifilm at a more consumer or hobbyist level. People loved the dials and the retro feel and everything and the X-H2, X-H2S, they went the way of like their GFX cameras. Uh, they actually, I mean, realistically, the X-H1 was the first one to do that. And then with the X-H2, with the X-H2S, I've said it too many times, with those cameras and with the X-S20, they've kind of gone this other way. And, and I think people are willing to forgive that on the X-H2S because it's like this video monster and people know that. And so they will work with it in that way. But the X-H2, I don't know. I just, I, I feel like there's not a lot of love for it comparatively. And so I think when I'm going to resell this camera eventually, if I decide to, uh, chances are I will be able to find a buyer more easily for this camera than for the X-H2. And that's an important consideration when you are a, you know, like filmmaker who's kind of running and gunning or when you're somebody who can't just hold on to things. Like I can't afford to have six cameras in the system or have three different camera systems. I have to really decide. So when I was looking at getting one camera as a full hybrid option, I really had to weigh all these things out and I had to look into the future a little bit. I know this camera is going to be great in the future for me for any of the work that I want to do for the next several years. I know it's going to hold up. I know that it's got great weather sealing and that it's just a very quality camera. And I know that eventually when I do go to sell it, I can get more for it than I could X-H2, which to be honest, I think is going to kind of fall by the wayside. It's going to be this sort of like expensive, almost flagship camera. That's not as cool as the X-Pro4. It's not as like, you know, small and handheld and retro as the X-T5. Um, it's not as Instagrammy and TikToky as the, you know, X100R. So I don't know. It's just, it's going to fall into a weird place. And I think tons of people who are professionals would still love that camera, but I think it's going to be a weird one. And I don't know that people are going to be able to get rid of it as easily. So. That's just something that we got to consider when we're buying stuff now. So those are the reasons I held on to my X-H2S over my X-H2. But what about you? What camera are you shooting on? Do you have either of those cameras? Did you decide one way or the other? Are you thinking about it? I imagine if you got to this video, it's for a reason. So let me know in the comments why you were thinking this was the kind of video you needed to watch and if these points resonate with you. Um, thank you so much for watching. I would love it if you would subscribe. I'm like real close to hitting a milestone uh, of 200 whole subscribers. And it would be very cool if we could do that with this video. So help me out um, and I will keep coming with the Fuji content because I've got a whole bunch planned before the X Summit in February. So thank you so much. And um, yeah, get out there and make some fun stuff and send it to me so I can watch it. Cool, peace. Tell them what you did. Tell them what you did. He caused a ruckus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.